Okay, we've learned some theoretical concepts about web services. And in this tutorial, we're going to go hands-on. We're going to write a Java application that consumes a web service. We are not writing a web service yet. We are writing a client, a web service client that uses an existing web service, makes a call to that web service and consumes the result. So what I'll be doing is I'll pick uh, randomly a web service that's available online for free. There are quite a few web services that are available online and uh, they're free to use. So I'm going to just pick one of them and we will write a sample Java client application that calls that web service. Uh, this one that I'm using is from this website, webservicex.net. It is just a random choice. I'm not really sure about the reliability of this web service. It could be down when you're trying it, but this tutorial is just intended as an example. Just make a note of the steps that I'm following here to consume the web service, and you can apply to any other web service, you know, in the similar way. So this web service is actually called GeoIP service. What it does is it enables you to easily look up countries by IP address or the context. So basically you pass in an IP address to this web service and the web service tells you which country that IP address is in. So if you pass in your IP address, it should tell you the country that you are in. So we're going to use this to implement a simple Java client, which takes in an argument, which is the IP address, and then it just prints out the country name on the console, right? Nothing fancy, it's just a basic Java program. But what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna call this web service and uh, we're gonna get the response and we're gonna print the response to the console. Simple enough, but it gets us started and we'll learn what it takes to implement a web service client. Okay, so when you look at this, this is actually the web service page and you have a description here and uh, you have a section here called this visdl schema location. We've learned earlier that the visdl is actually the contract. It's the interface that tells you about the web service. What is the service? What are the parameters and what's the return type? So I'm gonna just access this URL directly and uh, paste it in the browser. So this is the visdl. It's an XML document like we've already seen. Don't worry too much about all the elements over here. Uh, you know, frankly, you should not really be worrying about it. We have tools that helps us parse this. You can go into the details, but let's leave it as is for now. Okay, so what I want you to look at actually is this element over here, visdl colon service. There has to be one such element in any visdl. So it actually gives the name of the service. This name of the service is GeoIP service. And you have something called as the port. The port name is GeoIP service port. So just make a note of this. We'll revisit this port again in a little while. Okay, so now that we have this visdl, Right? Ideally, we should have all the information required to call this web service. So let's switch back to our Eclipse IDE. So I hope you have some kind of an Eclipse IDE set up on your machine. Uh, it need not be Java EE, a basic Java will do for this tutorial, but down the line, we're gonna be working with Java EE. So I recommend you download the Java EE version of Eclipse from eclipse.org and have it running. So I have, the Eclipse ID running over here, there are no projects. I'm gonna create a new Java project and I'll call it IP Location Finder, right? This is the name of my Java project. Okay, so you have a simple Java project with absolutely no class. Let's create a new Java class. So this is gonna be our main uh, class which contains the main method. So I'll call this also IP location finder, same name as the project, and I'll place this in my package org.kaushik.javabrains. And uh, I have a main method selected and I click finish. So I have the main class over here with a uh, blank main method. So what I plan to do here is I will accept an input argument, which is the IP address. And uh, in the main method, I'm going to take that IP address. I'm going to make a call to that web service that we just saw, the GeoIP web service. And the web service is going to return the country name. And I'm going to print the country name onto the console using a system.out.println. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to check 
if the input argument has been supplied. We should not run the program if there is no input argument, right? So I'm going to just do a check over here. Say if argument length is not equal to one, there has to be only one argument for this program. So if the argument length is not equal to one, I shall print a message about the usage of the program. And if the argument length is exactly one, then I'm going to assume that's the IP address and I'm going to call the web service. So I will have a string IP address that takes in the first argument, which I'm assuming is the IP address. Now I need to call the web service and pass this as an argument. Now, how do I do that? Now think about how you would do this if it were a local business service. Let's say you had uh, a service over here locally in your project which had a method called uh, get country and it takes an in IP address as an input argument. So it would be very simple, right? It would be that service, an instance of the service dot get country name and you pass in the IP address and this, me this method returns the name of the country, right? It would be very simple. But since this is actually a remote web service, how does it work? What actually happens here is in the case of a remote web service call, we have to use what is called as a service endpoint interface. We've learned what a service endpoint interface is in the previous tutorial. It's basically an interface to a service endpoint, a remote service endpoint. So how do we get that interface? We don't actually have to write that interface. We can have it generated for us, right? So there are tools which Java provides, which takes in a WSDL and it actually generates classes for us which we can actually use to make these calls just like we make uh, you know any other calls just like this one right instead of our local service we actually use the stub that gets that gets generated so this would probably be a stub so we generate the stub using the tools that java provides and then we call the method on that stub and what the stub does is it internally translates this to a web service call so that we don't have to worry about all the web service details. It's all hidden from us. All we need to do is just call a method on the stub. Okay, so how do how do we get hold of the stub? How do we generate the stub? So we have to use some of the tools that come with Java for this very purpose. So I'm going to switch to my command prompt here. So I'm in the home directory. What I'll do now is I will create a temporary directory called service endpoint interface. So it's, it's you know, I'm going to remove this later so you can call it whatever you want. And I'm going to switch to this directory. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to use a tool called as WS import. So this is a tool that actually comes with Java SE. You don't need Java EE for that. So if you have Java SE installed on your machine, you should have this tool called WS import. And considering that you have Java on your path, this WS import should also be on your path. So if you just use the WS import command, it should give you a brief idea of what and how to use it for. So basically you have the list of parameters, but take a look at the usage. It's basically WS import and the visual URL, right? It's simple. Just type in WS import and type in the URL where the WSDL is available. And you have some options which control how the WS import works, but the basic usage is very simple. Okay, so what is this WSDL URL? The URL is what we saw earlier, right? We entered the WSDL URL in the browser and we saw the WSDL XML rendered by the browser. So that is the same URL. So this is the visual URL, right? So we've already seen this. I'm going to just copy this and uh, let's try to run this command with the basic option, right? So I'll just do a WS import and I will paste the visual URL, okay? Now notice what happens. It's actually parsing the visual, right? It provides some warnings and it's generating the code. This code happens to be the SEI, the service endpoint interface code, and then it's compiling the code. So you have basic.java code generated. It's also compiling it, so we get a dot class. So we get a set of dot class files. 
So if you look now, there is a folder called net. Let's look at this generated folder. So I have the SEI folder open over here. So you have a net and inside that web service X and you see all these class files have been generated. Okay, so this is the basic uh, default behavior of WS import. It looks at the visdl URL, parses the visdl, so it generates the .java, compiles all the .java classes into .class bytecode, and it actually deletes the .java classes, the source. Now let's say you want to retain the .java files. So that's when the options come in. So basically any modification to this default behavior would mean you have to go look at these options and customize it the way you want. Okay, so now some of the options that are helpful here are the, the keep, which says keep the generated files. So basically I don't want the generated files to be deleted. All the dot Java files need to be retained. And you have a dash S directory which specifies where to place the generated source files. So I'm going to use these two options over here in order to retain the source code that is generated. Okay, so I've deleted all this stuff in the ACI folder. Let's do this one more time. And this time I'm going to retain the source code. So I'll do a WS import again. I'll do a dash keep and a dash S. Now the dash S would need a source directory. So I'm going to create a source directory over here. I'll say new folder SRC. Okay, and I'm going to use that SRC as the source directory. And again, I use the visdl URL, right? It's the same visdl URL. So let's run this now. And it does the same thing again. It parses, it generates the code, and it also compiles the code. But now if you take a look, so you have this, the package structure here for the class files, but you also have the source directory here which contains the source code, again, with the same package structure, right? So all the corresponding class files have this .java file associated with it. So these are all the classes that are generated by WS import. Don't worry too much about what all these classes are. We're going to look at that uh, in much more detail later. But these classes serve the purpose for us. We can use these uh, as stubs to actually call the remote web service. And now that we've learned how to generate these stubs from the visdl, the next tutorial we're going to learn how to actually use those stubs in our Java application. Thanks for watching.